Hi, a big welcome to everyone as you join this evening's program, which promises to be a really fun and really exciting program. I'm James Heimowitz, and I'm the president of China Institute. And I'd like to say a big welcome to all the China Institute members who have tuned in this evening. And if you're not a China Institute member yet, now's your opportunity to become one. Um, foundations and grant giving organizations really tend to measure um, our organization as, um, and membership is really one of the important ways that they look at us. So I encourage you to think about this this evening, um, especially with everything that's going on around us. I think the United States and China are rethinking the nature of our relationship. And we at China Institute are also helping to rethink, reset, and restart the way that America engages with China. And I think one of the most important things and the most important ways we can contribute to that is allowing people to have a genuine and authentic insight into what's happening in China. And I can't think of a better way of doing this through, than through the taste of China and the food of China um, and other kinds of things that we do, including music, including education, including business programs. And um, I'm delighted to announce that we'll be embarking and building out a new culinary center, which is gonna be right at the downstairs main entrance of China Institute on the ground floor. And I think it's important for us not to forget some of the common um, pleasures, which actually can be quite extraordinary. So without further ado, I wanted to hand this evening's program over to Dinda Elliott. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to also send a, a big thank you to Wild China and to Zhang Mei for partnering with us this evening. Thank you. We've got a special evening in store, and I'm really looking forward. Wonderful. Thank you, James. Um, hello, and welcome to the first episode of A Taste of China, an online program that pairs taste with place to explore China's vast culinary landscape. Uh, I'm Dinda Elliott, as James said, and I'm so honored to be here with my great old friend, Mei Zhang, Zhang Mei, the founder of Wild China, who are our partners on this exciting new program. We're doing a series of programs and each episode takes us to a different part of China. Um, today, we're traveling first to beautiful Yunnan on China's southwestern frontier. I know we've all been longing to travel and many of us can't travel right now. So this is a wonderful, wonderful way to do it um, virtually. Uh, so the region is one of the ethnic, one of the most ethnically diverse provinces of China and is known for its breathtaking landscape and deep multicultural roots. Uh, so Aaron, do we want to show um, the map just so that people can get located? That's great. Thank you. Uh, so there we are. Um, southwestern China, and you'll see uh, following some just some snapshots of some of the beautiful, beautiful scenery of Yunnan to give you a sense of what it's like when you actually go there. Uh, and at the end of the episode, we'll take questions from the audience. So please feel free to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen as we go along. Uh, we will also take a few live questions if we have time at the end. So if you'd like to ask a question live, just raise your hand by clicking on the raise your hand button at the bottom of your screen. You'll see it there. And when you're called upon, you'll be unmuted and given the, um, the floor to ask your question. So let me hand it over with no further ado to um, Zhang Mei. And I think she's going to actually take us to Yunnan. Hi, everyone. I am Zhang Mei, and I promise we'll get to noodles in just one second. <laughs> I'm just thrilled to be here with Dinda, my old friend, um, and all the other friends online. Just one, two warm welcomes. One is the entire class of Professor Paige Behrens, uh, class from San Francisco State University, studying tourism. You are the future of tourism. Delighted to have you all here. And also, I want to welcome those friends calling, dialing in from Indonesia. They are the culinary experts on the ground there. We are honored to have you and all old friends, new friends join us. Thank you. Uh, so let's dive straight in. Yunnan, Dali, my hometown. Dali. <laughs> Funny enough, it's right in the middle of Western Yunnan. And it's 200 miles to the east with, to Kunming and 200 miles straight to west border with Myanmar. And it's on this extension of the famous tea and horse 
caravan route that stretches from tropical Xichuanbana all the way up northwest into um, Tibet. So similar, very similar high altitude as Denver, about 5,000 feet, right? And because of its location and because of the topographies of Yunnan, the 20,000 feet peaks and sea level valleys naturally shaped our cultures and our foods to vary accordingly. That's why it's impossible, impossible to define what is called Yunnan food. So rather than trying to define, let's go to Frank, our Wild China guide, who is on the ground in Dali. Frank, are you there? Yes. Can we see your face? There you are. Okay. So Frank. This is yes. Frank from Dali. Take over. Um, thank you very much for having me today. I really appreciate it to have this chance to give you the introduction about our one spring noodle from uh, Weishan County. You know, Weishan is one of 11 counties in Dali Prefecture. It lies in southern part of Dali. In history, Weishan was the first place of the Nanzhao Kingdom in the Tang Dynasty. Until now, it preserved the many ancient streets and buildings of the Ming and Qing Dynasties. Today, we're very lucky we have a chance to show you the one string noodle from the Mr. Su, the restaurant. Okay, now let me introduce Mr. Su to you. Uh, okay, here's uh, Mr. Su, and he run this business for more than uh, 40 years in his family. Okay, now let me ask him some questions. Okay, yeah, so he just told me uh, his family run this business is over 40 years. So I asked Mr. Su, how many uh, families uh, run this business now in Weishan County. And he told me there are three families. I asked Mr. Su, how is the business of yours? And he said, among the three families in Weishan Old Town, he has the best uh, business. Congratulations, yeah. Okay, so now we will ask uh, Mr. Su, invite Mr. Su to introduce uh, us. What, how, what's the process of the uh, making for one skin noodle? Ah, to, uh, to the in the name Okay, now we will move to the workshop to make those. Okay, now you see Mr. Sue we're making the dough. He just added the water in the wheat flour. And he's mixing the flour with water.
So Frank, how many kilometers of dough does he make or flowers that he use every day? Uh, Oh, so Mr. Su told me um, the whole long of the whole length of the noodle he made in a day to be more than four or five kilometers long. <laughs> four or five kilometers long. How many people does he yeah. feed? Uh, this is also the pizza. Uh, about 300 people can eat this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, 300 people, that's amazing. Frank, I think because of uh, time concern, maybe uh, the dough making is very hard work, we can tell. Can he show us what happens next? Okay. Now I'm going to show you what Okay, so next the process, we will making the noodles uh, I guess. Uh, uh, just wait for one one minute more <laughs> yeah because they want guarantee the quality of the noodle they need the time to do all the process I think we're, this yeah. process is not easy for us because I think we, we need more power to make it. Uh, I think this is going to take a, a little while. Um, yeah. I can imagine, I, I don't think we can do uh, that heavy lifting so many times, so many pounds of flour a day, and he's, he's very strong. Please tell him he's very strong. <laughs> yeah. This is an it. Wow. Okay, now she brought on the uh, canola seed oil on the flower because it makes us easier and smoothly to make the one spoon noodle. And he also brush, brush the oil on the plate because otherwise the flowers will stick with the plate. Can you see it? Wow, that's fantastic. How many yeah, layers on each tray? Oh. About the 10 layers. 10 layers. Can he show yeah. it? Once the tray is filled, can he show us the one? Uh, finish one. That's beautiful. Hey, this is a one layer. For, for those who are listening to Frank, he keeps saying, Loba, no, Loba, he's his boss. Go ahead. Okay. Ah. Okay, now let's go back to the kitchen, okay? Beautiful. Thank you. Very nice. I play. It, how, how many years does it take the practice so that you don't break the one string of noodle? Okay, I will ask him. Yeah. Good one. 
Okay, now we will see the third process. We will put the one spoon noodle in boiling pot. Ah, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, Frank, th this is fantastic. Um, Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit of how his family started the business? Did he grow up eating this noodle in the village? How? Tell us a little story. Okay. 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 They're very shy. <laughs> this is to ask his wife to tell us the story about his family. Uh, is uh, Mr. Su's wife. Welcome, Mr. Su's wife, come to our live broadcast. Yes. あ、あ。あ。そう、え she, uh, she said, at the beginning, his, her mother-in-law was uh, running the business of the rice noodle. We call this a wheat flour noodle. They run the rice noodle business before. Then after, they noticed one string noodle is more special. So that's why the family choose this business to do. Well, perfect. We can now see how she puts together the bowl of noodle, how she spices it. And then we can um, go from here. But can we see? Can we move the camera yeah. a little closer, Frank? Thank you. I think I just carry, carry you to take a look. Yeah. Can you see? <laughs> yes. So in this basin, we have uh, spicy. You see the star anise? floating on the surface of the oil. And this oil is from a canola seed oil. Uh, in this basin, we have a bamboo shoot, pork, and mushrooms. Great. <laughs> and uh, we have uh, this, is uh, oil from a chicken pepper. You know chicken pepper? If you taste it, it will, it will make your non, a tongue feel numb. And this is the sesame seed they toasted before. When we put in the one string noodle soup, it will be more delicious. Because it's not. And this is a black pepper powder. Uh, this is uh, coriander. Cilantro, yeah. And yeah, cilantro. <laughs> Show us the pickle. Pickle, yeah. Sunset. 
Okay, so this is a pickle. It's made of the green vegetable, or some yeah. people call it a bitter mat vegetable. Uh -huh. I really love this very much because our Bai people in Dali, we love a sour and a spicy food. Yes. Uh, thank you, Frank. Can we um, see one bowl of finished noodle and tell us how much it costs? And we should leave you to eat your breakfast. We've taken enough of your time. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you see it? This is a bowl of a green noodle soup. And yeah. this bowl will cost uh, 10 yuan, 10 RMB. Is it very cheap? It's a dollar fifty for a lot of work, labor and love, and tasty noodles. Thank you so much, Frank. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. So we will dial back from Dali and we'll say goodbye. Please thank the host for us. And Dinda, I will hand okay. it over to you. I know you are dying to have a bowl of this noodle. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Frank. You're welcome. Okay, there we go. Can you see me? Um, thank you, Frank, so much. That was just unbelievable. And I feel like I'm right there with you and I can almost smell the noodles that are cooking. Uh, it's just unbelievable to think about the amount of labor that goes into one bowl of noodles that costs 10 kwai, which is about, you know, a dollar, a dollar 30 or a dollar 40 or something. It's so inexpensive. Um, so I want to turn now to our second guest, David Emer. Um, so, David, bring yourself up, uh, unmute yourself, and un, you know, open up your video. Thank you. And um, David is a journalist and an author, uh, a former foreign correspondent for, for the Sunday and Daily Telegraph in Beijing and Bangkok. And he is the author of critically acclaimed The Emperor Far Away, Travels at the Edge of China, in which he writes in depth about his travels in Yunnan. More recently, he's written another book called A Savage Dreamland, Journeys in Burma. Uh, and David is joining us today from Bangkok. So where it is, I guess, 8.23 a.m. So thank you for getting up early this morning. Um, thank you again to Frank for getting up super early because he had to get all the way to that noodle stall um, from his home. But David, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's really it's a pleasure, Linda. Great to have you here. Um, so let's start by setting the scene a little bit. Uh, you've spent a lot of time in Yunnan and um, Yunnan's tucked away in southwestern China as we saw along China's national borders with Vietnam, Laos and Myanmar. It's a region that's exploding with diversity. Why is it so unique in China? And especially I wanna hear really what made you fall in love with Yunnan? Well, I think you know, the key word Dinda is um, diversity. Uh, and you can break that down into sort of two elements, um, ethnic diversity and uh, geographical diversity. Um, Yunnan attracted me straight away just because it, it's by far the most ethnically diverse province in China. Um, you've got 25 of the country's 55 official minorities living there. Um, Almost 40% of the population, in fact, is uh, belongs to one of those groups. And um, so we're just going to scroll. Have you, as you talk, we're just going to kind of scroll sure. through some photographs so people can get a little flavor. And in fact, you know, when um, Beijing first started exploring Yunnan in the early 1950s, um, no fewer than 260 different groups came forward saying we want to be registered as you know official minorities. Um, they range from the very, very big, like the Yi, the Bai, the Dai, um, whose numbers run into the millions, and down to very, very small groups like the Dulong, which has only got 6,000 people. Hmm. Um, and geographically, they're just spread across this incredibly varied and very beautiful landscape, which is also, I think, um, 
as diverse as it gets in China when it comes to flora and fauna. Um, so in the center of the province where, where May is from, you get these sort of valleys, lakes, and plains, and historic cities like Dali and Lijiang. And then you go to the far north and it's very mountainous. Up on the borders with Tibet and Myanmar, you've got 5,000 meters, 6,000 meter peaks, which, you know, snow caps all year round. And then you go to the deep south and um, it's tropical jungle, it's palm trees, it's elephants. I mean, it's very, very much like, you know, a Southeast Asian feel. And, you know, that's, I think, why so many people love Yunnan, just because the, the, you, you can't be bored there because you're constantly moving through a different landscape. You're encountering different peoples. And also, I mean, I think by modern day standards, it's still quite remote, bits of it. And that, I think, has really helped maintain the diversity you see there. What is the um, the impact? I mean, I, I just remember being in Yunnan and seeing, you know, all these different pe people wearing different costumes and you know they're and they're not dressing up for tourists this is what they actually wear in their normal life so i'm really curious what you think the what is the impact of that ethnic diversity on yunnan's culture what is it what is it what is yunnan's well, culture like well i think you know it it's there isn't a single yunnan culture just because as you say there are so many different people um their own traditions their own dress distinct cuisine, um, they celebrate their own festivals. Um, I mean, linguistically, you know, they, they, most of these minorities have their own languages, which, um, you yeah, they're very, they're very different to Mandarin, that Tibeto-Burman or Thai or, um, you know, Hmong, Mien languages. Um, much more, you know, kind of what you'd hear if you're in Eastern Myanmar or Northern Thailand. Um, there's a huge amount of architectural diversity. I think, you know, you can go from one minority, you'll have a different temple style, different towns, different villages. Um, there's a lot of religious diversity as well. You've got some of the groups are um, following Theravada Buddhism, which is what you'll get in Southeast Asia. The other groups are Tibetan Buddhists. Um, you've got the Hui minority, which, you know, practice Islam. You've got a fair few Christians, and you've still got some animists who are, you know, following very ancient folk religions, which, you know, haven't changed really for, you know, a thousand years or more. Wow. Would you, in your travels in Yunnan, did you come across people sometimes who didn't, didn't even speak Mandarin, or do people pretty much, because of the educational well, system, do they... No, I think, you know, it's still common, you know, if you, you have to go to some reasonably remote places, but yeah, it's still common to meet old people, yeah, who, you know, whose Mandarin is very, very poor, I mean, um, or non-existent, and, yeah, and it's not just in Yunnan, actually, I mean, you can go to, there are other bits of China, too, where you can find people who, you yes. know, who really struggle, struggle right, in Mandarin. Right, absolutely, yeah. So, one thing that's really, you know, that I'm curious about is, despite the high percentage of non-Han non -Han residents in Yunnan, the province is really not known for the kind of high profile social unrest that you've seen in some of China's other board, borderlands. Um, what makes Yunnan different? Well, I think, uh, Dinda, there are, there are a few reasons for that. Um, you know, most importantly, uh, Beijing doesn't regard the minorities in Yunnan as a threat. Um, there's no sort of ethnic group in Yunnan who are agitating or pushing for independence or autonomy which is obviously not the case in some other parts of the country. Um, I think one of the really interesting things about Yunnan's minorities is that, that many of them are transnational peoples. So they're spread across into the neighboring countries as well. So Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, Thailand, they have the same ethnic groups. And I think that means they have a different concept of the homeland. Um, they're not really confined by borders or frontiers. You know, who you are is more about your ethnicity rather than about what passport you actually sort of carry. Mm. It's sort of less important to them. Um, but I think um, because they're not seen as a threat, that means they get more leeway uh, than other minorities might get. I don't think Beijing is you know, worried if they want to celebrate their festivals or walk around in their traditional costume. Um, and that's kind of also reflected in the fact that the borders in Yunnan 
are much more fluid than uh, elsewhere in China. You know, um, the minorities move across to Laos, Myanmar, Vietnam, you know, very easily. And, you know, Beijing doesn't try and stop them. Mm-hmm. Whereas obviously, you know, in Tibet and Xinjiang, the borders are extremely heavily guarded and, you know, you can't yeah. really move around. Yeah. So earlier this summer, we had May on another one of our uh, programs and she talked a little bit about some of the cultural heritage that she's seen kind of disappear since her childhood. Um, and I'm curious as to whether you've seen that as well. But, you know, at the same time, I know that, uh, you know, the Yunnan's diverse cultures are still very much alive and that's the amazing thing about it. But I just wonder, is there, you know, as modernization sweeps through all of China, you know, is, is how is Yunnan changing? I think, um, you know, the, when the Han Chinese sort of first started traveling to Yunnan in the sort of late 1990s as tourists, um, there was an element of sort of tokenizing the minorities a little bit almost sort of fetishizing them in a way. I think, you know, they expected to see all singing, all dancing. Sort of dancing minorities, yeah, in their yeah, costumes. In, in their traditional costumes. Uh, yeah, I think that's changing a bit now. Yeah, I think Chinese tourists, domestic tourists are more sophisticated now. Yeah. Um, and I think also the tourism is constantly evolving. Um, and I think yeah, there's a general trend that people want, you know, a more unique kind of experience rather than like, you know, an ethnic minority theme yes. park, you know, you know yes. um, I think, you know, Yunnan has done, you know, it's done a pretty good job of maintaining its diversity. I, I do think, like May said, I mean, earlier that some cultural her- heritage is going, you know, I, the sad thing for me is that the languages aren't being spoken as much as they used to. And, you know, language is such a huge part of ethnic identity. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So I think that will have an impact. I mean, I think it, in the future, you know, it'll still be a very valid experience, but it might be, you know, slightly less authentic than, um, than it was once. Yeah. Then, so. Thank you so much for joining us, David. I, I must say, I think for me, maybe the most striking beauty of Yunnan. Some people love the, you know, the snub-nosed monkeys, whatever, but but for me, it's the architectural um, diversity. It's the, the architecture is just so gorgeous there, and I just can't wait to get back there again. I'm sure you feel the same way. Yeah, I would love to be back there, sure. Yeah. So, so David, we'll have you stay on for a few minutes, if you will, but this is a perfect segue to introduce our next guest, Georgia Friedman, who will help help us get into some of the more specifics of Yunnan's food scene. I should actually, before we move on to Georgia, let me ask you, what are some of your favorite Yunnan dishes? Um, well, I, I mean, I always eat very, very well in Yunnan. It's uh, my <laughs> favorite, the favorite place. Um, I mean, I like the sour, sour and spicy style they have. I mean, um, especially in the south of the province where you get the Southeast Asian influence. Um, there are amazing seasonal vegetables, which you know, sort of seem to change every month. Uh, the mushrooms are legendary. Uh, when I lived there in the South in Jinghong, um, you know, barbecue was a really big deal for the locals. Um, what do they barbecue? Well, I got into, you know, they used to great grilled pig brain, which you put in a banana leaf and then just put on the barbecue. Um, and it, yeah, it tastes a lot better than maybe it sounds. Um, I always ate bamboo worms there, which are a great beer snack. Um, you can get them elsewhere in, in China, but they cost more and they don't taste as good as they do in Yunnan. Wow, um, that's great stuff. <laughs> and, uh, and bamboo worms. Okay, go on, keep going. You can, get cheese, very hungry. <laughs> you can get cheese there, which you can't really get. You know, oh, yeah. You know, the rubing, um, which, you know, is very much a Dali thing. Um, I mean, you know, which you can eat with a ham. It's kind of like a prosciutto, prosciutto mozzarella sort of thing. Um, yes, yes, yes. So, yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of food in Yunnan. I mean, Georgia will, will show us all. All right. So next time I have a beer, I'm going to think about the bamboo worms. Uh-huh. Hey, right. Thank you so much, David. Okay, so listen, I'm going to turn it over to um, Georgia, and May is back with us. So May and Georgia are going to have a chat now. I'm, I'm going to disappear. Thank you, Dita. Thank you, David. 
I think what David said, Yin and the ethnic groups, who you are is defined by your ethnic culture, not by your passport. That is the best line I've heard. Uh, growing up in Vietnam, with, despite of whatever happens in Beijing, we never felt there was any distance between us, I'm a Han, and any ethnic groups. It's just different season, people do different things, people eat different things, different traditions. Anyway, moving on. Um, Georgia, Georgia Friedman, welcome. She, she is the author of Cooking South of the Clouds. Yunnan literally means South of the Clouds, right? Recipes and stories from China's Yunnan province. And she's also a freelance journalist and editor. And uh, in, we will ask you how you created this book. But to start off, as a Yunnan person, I've always had a bit, sort of carried a bit of a chip on my shoulder and thinking, Yunnan food is the greatest in China, but it's not recognized as one of the four main schools of cooking in China. Why is that? What do you think? Should it be a Yunnan school of cooking? Yeah, um, well, so thank you so much for having me um, to come talk about this because I, this is obviously one of my favorite topics. Um, right. But yeah, so I think you touched on it at the very beginning of all of this a little bit. Um, it's very hard to define Yunnan cuisine, I think, because it, there isn't one cuisine. You know, as we've discussed, there are a lot of different minority groups um, and ethnic groups that have their own cuisines and their own food traditions. And then um, there are also this wide geographic range. You could be up in the mountains and be eating Tibetan style food, um, or you could be down in the south and eating food that is, you know, fried river wheat. That's the kind of thing that you might find in northern Laos. Um, also, one thing that we haven't touched on yet, Yunnan is the single most biodiverse part of Asia. So yeah. if you, you know, think about, there are 800 different varieties of mushrooms that have been categorized in Yunnan. Uh, there's an institute in Kunming that's categorized, I think 6,000, I think about 6,000 different sub varieties of rice being grown in Yunnan. So if you think about all of this diversity, you get a lot of different foods that we all have to conceptualize as Yunnan food. Um, but there are some, um, <clears throat> we'll see some of the pictures of lots of different kinds of meals. Like for instance, you know, this is a lot of grilled food down from Shishuang Banat, and you'll see other meals from other parts of Yunnan to show the differences. Um, but there are certain things that we can talk about as being sort of true across lots of different parts of Yunnan or all of Yunnan. Chilies. There are lots of chilies in Yunnan that might be dried chilies, it might be pickled chilies, um, or it might be fresh chilies, depending on where you are. Um, and in some places, what time of year, some places the fresh chilies are year round and some they're not. Um, pickled foods. Uh, pickled foods are common in every part of Yunnan. It just depends on what you're pickling. Some people are pickling the chilies, some people are pick pickling vegetables, dark vegetables, sort of old pickles that sit for a long time. Um, some people are doing quicker pickles that you use much more quickly. Um, in the West and in the South, sometimes you find pickled bamboo shoots, which have this very sun uh, funky sour flavor to them. Um, so lots of different pickles. And then also, uh, people really take advantage of the diversity, the biodiversity in Yunnan. And there are a lot of, um, a lot of forage foods all over Yunnan, which is really one of my favorite things about Yunnan. Depending on the season and depending on where you are, people are gathering um, flowers from different trees in the mountains in order to dye the rice or flavor different things. Um, or they're picking greens and they're using those greens to make yang ban, like cold salad-like dishes. Um, so those things are true everywhere in Yunnan. It's just how those things are used uh, that changes depending on where you are. Guess what dish I'm making after this? Actually, not a dish. I'm actually drying some uh, mustard greens to make suan Nice. Right. I haven't started this year. I feel I'm not willing to admit that it's fall yet, but yeah, it's it's the time to make suan Yeah, that that is the one ingredient I cannot find in the United States. So um, you, you are making me very very homesick. So I'm so delighted that you fell in love with my home. So what made you, what made you write this book? Tell us how you, sort of the thought process. Sure, so um, I actually, so the picture up now is crossing the bridge rice noodles. And that is kind of the dish that um, 
helped me fall in love. It got me to Yunnan in the first place and helped me fall in love with the province. I was studying in Beijing in the summer of 2000 as a college student and Beijing was very, very hot. And one of our professors uh, was originally from Yunnan and she'd written a chapter in our textbook about the weather in Yunnan and about crossing the bridge rice noodles. And um, so I had a break and a friend and I picked up and went to Kunming and traveled from Kunming up to Dali um, and just took a week and got to know that area. And I fell completely head over heels in love with Kunming. It was, you know, back 20 years ago, it was much quieter. I sat in Tsuihu and wasn't bothered by anybody for like an hour while I read a book. It was a very different time. Um, but I had this one bowl of Guo Chen Xian crossing the bridge rice noodles that just stuck in my mind for years and years. And I thought someday I'm going to move back, I'm going to move to Kunming and I'm going to learn more about the foods of, um, of Yunnan. You did it. Fantastic. How did you do it? Do you speak Yunnan dialect? I don't. I speak a workable amount of Woyu, of Mandarin. Uh -huh. um, and I find, um, as David was saying, most people speak Mandarin um, in Yunnan. Most people speak Mandarin with very heavy dialect. And that dialect or accent even, you know, they don't realize they're switching into dialect. They don't realize they're switching into accent. But it, can, it changes everywhere you go. So instead of trying to improve my Chinese while I was there, I started learning how to listen to people's accents as carefully as possible so that I could still converse with them. And then I would run a recorder because we always run into things that I don't have vocabulary for. Someone's job is about making silicon, not a word I would have learned in college necessarily. Um, or, you know, someone with a very thick accent would say something and I would miss part of what that he was saying. So it was nice to have a recorder to go back and refer to. Um, and eventually when I started to get farther away from that sort of north-south access, you know, most people will travel from Kunming up through Dali and Lijiang and Xiangli La or down to Xichuang Bana. But as I started getting out east and west more, I also started hiring more local guides um, yes. just so that I wasn't uh, having to only talk with people who understood my sometimes poor Mandarin or people you know, who, who might be uncomfortable with speaking with me. Um, and that was also very helpful. Frank can be very helpful. Um, <laughs> What, um, what are your, some of your local favorites? Do you, I think you might have a couple of images. Tell us yeah. some yeah. things um, on the road. Sure. Um, well, so I, um, the, the Crossing the Bridge Rice Noodles is definitely still a favorite. And one of the things that I did for the book was I went down to um, Mengzhu, where the dish is originally from, because I'd been craving this, you know, you have these memories of what something tastes like, and I could never find that taste. Um, but when I went down to Mengzhu, I realized that it's because the original version of Crossing the Bridge Rice Noodles, the broth is just much, much more flavorful than what you get in the chain places that have sort of taken over in other cities. It's this really deep, rich broth, and they cook it with um, usually both pork and chicken in the pot together, but also other kinds of meats end up in there as well, depending on who is making it and which place you're at. Um, and so I went down there and I found the oldest place in town, which um, this is a picture of. This woman had originally had a restaurant in Kunming and it turned out that she originated this style that you see here of having each ingredient in its own separate saucer, which was in my mind sort of that first moment, that was the style I had the first time. And so I was so thrilled to find this woman who originated this style. Um, and she also originated putting the chrysanthemum petals in, which is something that everybody has started doing now. Um, I am also obsessed with um, our kwai, the rice cakes that are made not from glutinous rice, but from uh, firm regular rice. Well, not regular rice. You have to find a rice that has the right gel consistency and the right, you know, there are all kinds of different issues with the proteins, the firmness of the rice. So I actually haven't been able to make it in the US because we don't get the right kinds of rice here in the markets. Um, I also went and visited some ham makers on one of my trip out in Kweidze um, and Shanghai, And the dishes that they made with those hams were incredible. You know, if you're at the ham maker's house, they're slicing bowls and bowls of this stuff and using it in these really, really simple dishes that have this incredible flavor. His wife does this thing where she coats the inside of a bowl 
with slices of ham and then she puts pieces of potato on top and steams it and then flips it over. And so the potatoes take all the fat from the ham and have this incredible flavor. It's one of the simplest uh, recipes in my book, but it's absolutely one of the best. Um, and so that's, you know, I, there, I could go on for a long time about my favorite dishes in Yunnan, but th those are a few. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll get really hungry. Yeah. So what do you think the role of um, Yunnan food, um, say in America or in Europe, right? We are going through this complete rebranding. Cecilia Chang, who is turning a uh, hundred this year, right? She brought Chinese food from the very cheap takeout to banquet level. <laughs> And now we have Michelin star Mr. Jews in San Francisco. Where do you think, is there, is there a place for you know food? I mean, it's already very hip in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm actually very excited about it. Um, because I do think that when we start to get Yunnan food, we're actually getting a slightly better quality of food than we might have if this had happened 15 or 20 years ago. The places that are starting up in the US are not these like cheap takeaway places like people used to think Chinese food had to be. The, the places that are starting up like um, Plenty of Clouds in Seattle, there's, and I think there's a place called Water Song in Baltimore, although I haven't been. These are more mid-range restaurants, you know, where you're actually paying a reasonable amount of money for your food, as you should, and getting a really high quality. Um, I think those restaurants that you find in Beijing and even in um, Singapore, I had a really nice Yunnan meal in Singapore, and those restaurants do sort of greatest hits, you know, they, there's some mushroom dishes and some ganba and um, some chi guo ji and some guo chi mi and like all the, all the things. Um, and then they also lean pretty heavily on the foods that you find in the West and in the South, the more tropical flavors, because I think that when people think about Yunnan food, the thing that they are most surprised by is how much like Southeast Asian food, Chinese food can be if you're in Yunnan. So I think those same flavors could be really interesting here. And I'd love to see some of those same restaurateurs open here or someone go and see how they're doing it because I think people would absolutely love it. Maybe you should think about it. I, I don't know that I need to get into the restaurant business, but I'm happy to work with anyone. I was just thinking I should call Brandon Chu and suggest that his next restaurant should be a Yunnan restaurant. You, you fantastic, Georgia. Thank you so much. You. I know, um, please stay on for a few minutes. I know Dingo's been scrolling through the questions yeah. with the tears off. So we need, we need everybody to come back just in case there are questions for all of you. So David, please feel free to bring your video back. But um, yes, we want, we definitely want to take some questions from the audience. I see one here from Indonesia, which is so wonderful. Hold on, let me just find the question. Um, it is from Adeputri Paramadita oh, uh, from Indonesia, Adeputri. And um, Adi Putri says, I'm curious about the veggies that are most consumed in Yunnan and the way they eat them. So if anybody wants to jump in, probably that one's for you, Georgia. But I also just want to urge people to either raise your hand or, um, you know, type a question so we can get your questions. Go ahead. Yeah, so vegetables. As I was saying, there's a lot of foraged greens. Um, so different things that you won't find that are specific to a particular region. Um, but one of the things that I really love in Yunnan is that people in Yunnan eat a lot of flowers, actually. You can find a lot of stir-fried dishes with flowers. Some of them are um, flowers that we might recognize like squash blossoms. Squash blossoms are stir-fried or eaten in soup. Mo most vegetables are either stir-fried, eaten in soup, very simple broth, vegetables, maybe a little fat and salt in there, um, or um, blanched and then um, cooled and dressed with a like a salad. Um, there are also occasionally raw vegetables eaten in Yunnan, which is not true of most places in China. You can get like chrysanthemum greens in a nice salad, which is a very rare thing to find in China. Okay, uh, go ahead, please, May. I have to tell you a story. I, I, I went to Bodega Bay Ranch and they have these um, uh, squash growing. So I just went in and foraged all the tips of the squash plants, vines and flowers and put a little olive oil, heat it up, actually canola oil, heat it up, a little bit of garlic, <coughs> salt and stir fry. That's, that's what we do at home. Try it tonight. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Linda. 
Okay, so I want to ask Aaron, Aaron, who's behind the scenes, there's a question that you can, you can check on while I'm asking the next question, but uh, someone's asking, what was the location of the second slide at the beginning of the program, the image of the high mountains? So if you can just scroll through and see if you can figure that out. But uh, the question I'm going to ask now is from Gabby Yang, and Gabby is asking, what's the best place to shop for traditional Yunnan ingredients, uh, such as ham? in New York City. Uh-oh, now that's going to be tricky because May's in California and so is Georgia. Uh, and David's in Bangkok. So go ahead, May. <laughs> I, I have an answer for that, actually. All right. Well, first of all, I studied him <laughs> intensively and wrote, wrote a book about traveling around that. Can you hold that up for a second so people, because that is a beautiful, beautiful book that was written by May, mm -hmm. Travels Through Dolly with a Leg of Ham. So everybody should get that book, everybody should get George's book, everybody should get David's David. book. Everybody's been asking for the titles of all of your books, so people should all go out and buy them. Go ahead. So, so the Very interesting fun. thing is I found in the States um, a gentleman called Alan Benton in Tennessee. He smokes his ham and sort of cures his ham in a very similar way. I met him at a food conference and you can completely take his ham and to cook any of these recipes from Georgia's book, from my book, I'm sure it, it, it'll work. It's better than Smithfield's ham. Alan Benton. Okay. Alan ben Benton's <laughs> ham. Yep. I also use Spanish ham, jamón ibérico, when I do my recipes because it's the closest, the Spanish version of a cured ham is the closest that I can get to a Yunnan ham. So that's when I shop for ingredients, and I lived in New York for 15 years before moving to China. Um, but so, I would just go to Chinatown and then you need your Spanish ingredients which are perfectly easy to get in New York. And then you need a Thai shop as well because you can't get the pickled bamboo shoots and a lot of the times different kinds of ingredients, you know, Vietnamese ingredients, for instance, Vietnamese herbs, sawtooth herb, um, things like that are also very important in Southern and Western foods. So I've got a couple of people here who I suspect are in Seattle. Um, and they're both asking, what was the name of the restaurant in Seattle, that George, Georgia, that you mentioned? Uh, plenty of Clouds. I, I have clouds. not, I was going to go this year, unfortunately, so that hasn't happened. Um, but I've been following their Instagram for a really long time and chatting online with the owner and the food just looks amazing. Fabulous. Okay, Aaron, can I bring you back to, to ask you what was the uh, you know, name of the, what was the place that was on that slide? And while you're figuring that out, uh, I did have, there's another question that's come in. Go ahead, Aaron. I saw a question here. Go ahead, go ahead, Meg. If Aaron's ready. Um, Amy Xu asks, just curious, do any of the proceeds from the books go to locals in Yunnan? Um, I always pay my teachers. It's not the most journalistically appropriate thing to do, but it's not my food. And so what I did was I worked with different families. I profile all of them to some extent, most of them in the book, either in, you know, I have their portraits and stories about their families or just in the head notes. Um, but I found people who wanted to share um, Yunnan's cuisine um, and wanted more Americans and Westerners to know about Yunnan and to visit because it would benefit their businesses. Um, and then absolutely, I pay for all of the ingredients and then I make sure to pay for the, um, for the lesson as well, um, which, you know, cookbooks are not exactly a money-making venture. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I made sure to spread it around. Um, and, you know, we, I'm still in touch with a lot of them. We try to send each other business. Wonderful. I have a question here that's for, probably for both David and um, Georgia. Um, the question is from Bessie Lee and Bessie is asking, saying Yunnan is home to the lesser known roots of the Southern Silk, Ro Silk routes in and around Dali. Uh, and so the question is, what's the influence of those trade routes, both into and out of Yunnan in local and regional cuisine? Um, how is the cuisine influenced from inside and outside of Yunnan, both in and out of China? And so I know, David, you've traveled, you know, across those borders, so you might be able to talk about the similarities or differences. And, George, I'm sure you have thoughts on that, too. Well, I mean, I think, um, you know, trade routes don't just carry uh, goods. They carry ideas, uh, religion, and cuisine as well. So, I mean, they play a, play a massive role, I think, in bringing uh joining cuisines together i mean 
if you go across, obviously, into, into eastern Myanmar, you get many of the same ingredients and uh, dishes with some local variations that you get in Yunnan. Um, I mean, I think uh, it's a merit argument that pasta arrived in Italy because it traveled down the Silk Road from uh, Xinjiang. Um, so, I mean, Georgia might know more. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time on, I mean, they call it the T-Horse Road for a reason, right? The Southern Silk Road is called the T-Horse Road because they were transporting, one of the main commodities was transporting tea from Chichon Banapur up to Tibet um, and then bringing horses down for the armies. Um, but, you know, if you look at all the different places that the Southern Silk Road crossed in the many centuries that it crossed, um, Arquai, which I talked about, the rice cakes was a major food along that route. And I imagine that uh, I mean, it's because people could travel with it. But, you know, as people were eating it, that food became something that was common across the province as a result. There can was salt. That, can you describe that rice cake? You said it's called Arquai? Arquai. So it's a firm rice cake. You can either um, have it be like a baba, like a pancake, and toast it and fill it with things. Or you can make it as a brick and slice it very thinly and stir fry it with vegetables and ham and all, you know, anything really, it's fantastic. Or you can um, slice it very thin in, into noodles. These days they make the noodles on a conveyor belt. You don't have to make the brick first, but, and those noodles are sort of dense and chewy um, and wonderful and sort of soak up any, you can add them to any different kind of soup. Um, but if you, you know, there were medicinal herbs that were transported along the Southern Silk Road. Salt from central Yunnan was transported along. Um, and thinking about, you know, modern day, a lot of the, um, the French and the British also traveled those routes when they came into the region. So if you think about the baked goods that you find in Kunming sometimes, that's something that came up with the French from um, Vietnam. And if you, um, as David was saying, you know, I think about the condensed milk that's used in a lot of Western Yunnan this, and sweet and condensed milk, that's clearly a British influence. So all those things, you know, the Southern Silk Road was going all the way through World War II. So it's a long period of history and a lot of food. So um, thank you for that. That's great. I'm going to take one raised hand, but first I'm going to give you the answer to the question about that slide, which was the, I believe it was, you're referring to the monastery with the mountains in the background, and that is Song Song Zanlin Monastery, which I'm sure I'm pronouncing wrong, but Zanlin Monastery in Shangri-La. So somebody was asking about that. So I've got a raised hand here. So this is Lisa Han. And Lisa, um, Aaron from behind the scenes is gonna unmute you so you can ask your question in person. Lisa, are you there? Or has she disappeared? Maybe she got tired of waiting. She was just there. Oh, there she is. Um, so Lisa, you can speak now if you wanna ask your question. Lisa? I think we may have lost All right. her. Oh, so I'm gonna move I'm gonna move on to one more question from um, Vita Datal from Indonesia Gastro Gastronomy Network. And Vita wants to know. Uh, for all the first time travelers to Yunnan, if you have only three days, what are the places or food destinations that we must visit to experience the Yunnan, Yunnan food culture? That's a great question. That's a good one for you, May, no? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody can answer. Any, yeah. These are all great. You all have different answers. I can't do three days. It's too short. It, you, you fly all the way. Give me five days. Um, I think, you know, go to fly to Kunming, take the high speed train from Kunming to Dali. You've got to experience that. It used to take us eight hours overnight bus ride. Now it's two hours high speed train, get to Dali. And all the food around Dali is great. What Frank showed us, the one street noodle is only one of the noodles of many, many, many. Right. And then travel, I would probably go from there, either go to Tengchong or go to Shaxi, a little village on the Tian Horse Caravan Road. That's absolutely beautiful. And that's at least two nights each place. That's four nights. Um, so give me five days. 
I think you'll be able to uh, see maybe 10% of Georgia's book coverage. <laughs> so we need more time. Uh, and I would say the best way to, to really um, pay tribute to the region is come and visit, really, and read all the books about them. So wonderful. And you know what? what in these difficult times for U.S.-China relations, et cetera, and so much misunderstanding, what people keep saying is the best thing for people to do is just to go to China. You've got to go and see it yourself and decide you like it, you don't like it, whatever. Just go and see it because then you'll have a deeper understanding. And there is, I really agree with all you guys that there's no place more beautiful and no place better to go in China than Yunnan. So um, I think Unfortunately, it's now a little past 10, but I want to thank you all so much. May, I want to thank Wild China so much for your wonderful partnership. Wild China is a fabulous travel company. So when we're all ready to travel, what they really specialize is experiential travel. So it's like the real deal. You get to really see what real life is like. And um, I really hope you all you know, sign up with them and, and visit Yunnan when, when we're all able to travel again. Um, David, it was fantastic to hear your perspective, uh, you know, from the journalist perspective of the, the um, diversity of Yunnan, Georgia. Thank you so much for your uh, wonderful um, description of the food. We're all so hungry at this point. And a special, special thank, of, of course, to Frank and to Mr. and Mrs. Sue in um, Weishan. Is that the name of the village? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was just incredible. So you really took us to Dali and thank you so much for that, Frank, for getting up so early to um, you know, bring the, the um, wonderful, wonderful experience and aromas of the uh, Igan Mian, the one, one string noodle, right? Yes. Um, we're very grateful for that. So thanks everyone. We, we hope you'll join us for episode two of this series of A Taste of China, uh, which is gonna be about fine wine hand-grabbed mutton, and the flavors of Ningxia. So we're going to be, May and her crew are going to take us to visit a vineyard in Ningxia and a wonderful woman entrepreneur there. And then we'll learn about the flavors of Ningxia. And that's going to be on Tuesday, October 20th, also at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 6, PM, uh, 6, 6 p.m. California time, and uh, 9 a.m. China time. So. Um, Please join as members of China Institute. Again, your membership just means so much to us and it really helps us bring to you wonderful programs like, like this and the fabulous speakers that we've had tonight. Um, Wild China, by the way, also has a newsletter on best places to eat, drink and love, and of course travel and cool events like this one. So um, please join wildchina.com. Right, so over to you, May, for some final closing words, but I want to thank you all so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Dinda. I just want to thank everybody and echo what you just said. And the best way to really see the land is come travel with us. Uh, we do, I do have a food trip. We go eat not just ham, but all the delicious Yunnan food next December not this December, December 2021. We will be back on the road again. Let's hang there. And there is the end at, uh, there is light at the end of the pandemic. I know. And fun I'm, and food. I'm signing up for that Yunnan trip. Thank you all so Thank much you. for bringing us to Yunnan. Take care. Thank you.